very explosive hearing on Capitol Hill today. Democratic presidential candidate RFK Jr. testified about government censorship, and surprise, surprise, the Democrats on the committee tried to censor him. Can't make it up. Take a look how things went down. I was the first person censored by, the, as the chairman pointed out, by the Biden administration two days after it came into office. This is a letter that many of you signed. Many of my fellow Democrats, I've spent my life in this party. I've devoted my life to the values of this party. There's 102 people signed this. This itself is evidence of the problem that this hearing was convened to address. This is an attempt to censor a censorship hearing. I move that we move into executive session because Mr. Kennedy has repeatedly made despicable anti-Semitic and anti-Asian comments as recently as last week. To say that, that I, I wrote a, I created a film that encourages blacks not to get adequate medical care is just completely abhorrent. If the, Don't if the, use my it's words, the witness's time. Do not the, censor the witness. I'm not the, censoring the, the witness. The, yeah. I'm not the, censoring the witness. He's still if talking. It is the, it's I it's my the time and I've given it to the witness. Do not censor him. If I'm the, not censoring him. If the views that you and others have applied to me, I've attributed to me, if they were actually true, I can see why I shouldn't be able to testify here today. Those are not true. These are defamations and mal malignancies that are used to censor me, to prevent people from listening to the actual things that I'm saying. Wow. As a reminder, we have an exclusive town hall with RFK Jr. next Tuesday night right here in New York City. <laughs> Tickets are free. Just go to Hannity.com. Here with reaction, he is the chairman of the very important House Subcommittee on the Weaponization of Government and the House Judiciary Committee. Jim Jordan is with us. Congressman, great to have you. All right. It's a hearing on censorship, and Democrats tried to censor their fellow Democrat. Can you explain that, Congressman? Right. Can't make that well, up. Well, nothing's new, Sean. They've been after... Yeah, they've been after this guy since, as, as he said, and I said in the opening statement, since the second day of the Biden administration, there's a tweet, or excuse me, an email that goes to Twitter from the White House that says, take down this tweet ASAP, and the tweet is, is from Robert F. Kennedy, and there is nothing in that tweet that is wrong. Everything is factually accurate, and yet they're trying, in fact, the subject line of the email says, RFK misinformation, but it wasn't misinformation. It was accurate. And frankly, even if it was, the First Amendment protects that as well. So the Democrat Party has now become the party of censorship, the party that doesn't embrace the most important liberty we have, our right to talk, our right to speak, and to speak in a political fashion and not be harassed and targeted for doing so. But they did it to, of, of all people, the most famous name in Democrat politics for the last what, three quarters of a century is the Kennedy name, and they're so committed to this censorship, they're even going after him. Okay, now, one of the worst examples of real censorship, the FBI, and this goes to the heart of the Judiciary Committee investigation yeah. that you are a part of, the FBI has Hunter Biden's very real laptop, and they have it in December 2019. Uh, and they authenticated that it was his in March of 2020. And then in the months leading up to the election in 2020, the presidential election, the FBI was meeting weekly with big tech companies. We learned from the July 4th yep. ruling in that case in Missouri, Eric Schmidt was the AG, he's now a senator from Missouri. We learned that the integrity site had a Twitter, guy by the name of Yoel Roth, that he was being told by FBI officials that had the laptop, that verified the authenticity of the laptop, that in fact their company and every other big tech company was being told that they may be victims of misinformation that may be about Joe and Hunter Biden. The FBI also knew that the president's attorney, President Trump's attorney, had a copy of Hunter's laptop and that would likely be leaked. Lo and behold, the laptop story comes out in the New yeah. York Post. <laughs> And they all censored it. And the American people didn't get to see yep. it. And a lot of polls show it would have had a dramatic, drastic impact right. on that election.
Yeah, and Sean, what we learned this week is that day that that, that story comes out, Emma Jo Morris, who testified today, was the author of that story in the New York Post. The day that story comes out, the FBI just happens to be meeting with Twitter that same day. And in that meeting, someone from Twitter, we got this from Laura Dimlow, head of the Foreign Influence Task Force at the FBI when we deposed her three days ago. That same day, Twitter's meeting with the FBI. Someone from Twitter asked the FBI, is the laptop real? The FBI, some agent answers, yes, it is. And then quickly, an FBI lawyer jumps in the conversation and says, no further comment. So they confirmed it, and then they went to no comment. Later that same day, the FBI is also meeting with Facebook. Facebook asked the same question because that day, that was the biggest story. And people were wondering, and these companies were wondering because, as you pointed out, Sean, they'd been prepped to understand a hack and leak operation was coming. It was going to involve Hunter Biden. Here it comes, and they want to know if it's real. The FBI in the meeting with Facebook, uh, Facebook says, no comment. So they will not confirm what they know to be true. In fact, what one agent kind of slipped up, it looks like, and confirmed to Twitter earlier that same day. Important information. Now we know that they knew the same people who were briefing about this hack and leak thing coming, they knew ahead of time and wouldn't confirm it and allowed the country in just days before the most important election we have, allowed the country to, to have that story censored, which is exactly what happened. Let me go to this other issue and what we now know as it relates to Joe Biden, the president, and that is this FBI informant. Now we, have, now we know why the DOJ and the FBI didn't want to hand over that 1023 form. Now we know it's in that 1023. Credible source, uh, human source, telling the FBI that, in fact, that it, in the case of, of Biden and Burisma, that Hunter Biden, who they thought was dumb, was being paid money because Joe Biden was going to help protect them. Joe Biden brags about protecting uh, Burisma by demanding the investigator. The prosecutor gets fired. He gets fired. Hunter continues to get paid. And the Biden family makes a fortune in the process. Uh, what do you call that in Ohio, uh, uh, Congressman? Because I have a word for it here in New York. Yeah, yeah, we call it wrong, and we certainly call it suspicious. And I thought what John no, Solomon said the in right your first word. segment, Sean. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you can say well, what you can. I'll say it, so you I'll say say it in a nice think, way. Sean. That's called but, a shakedown. Uh, that is called influence yeah. peddling. Yeah, but I do think what John Solomon said earlier, Sean, where remember in 2019, this is what they went after President Trump on. It was all about Burisma and the phone call in Ukraine. This is so when John Solomon said we got to go back, I, I lived that. I was in the bunker in the basement with, with Adam Schiff doing these depositions, defending President Trump because it was so ridiculous. But they attacked President Trump on the very thing they were involved in. So typical of the Democrats, it seems to me. So John Solomon's right. Let's go back and dig into those facts. I think that will be interesting, something I'm going to be doing over the next few weeks. All right, Jim Jordan, keep up the great work. Important stuff that you guys are doing. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else. Well, I tell you what, it's been a day on Capitol Hill. That heated House hearing underway again on the weaponization of government and big tech censorship. President Biden's top challenger on the left, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is a key witness. And it's kind of ironic that Democrats on the committee tried to censor him today about a censorship topic. They wanted to block his testimony because of some controversial comments that were attributed to him. Watch. Why would the Republican leadership in the committee majority give a hearing and a platform to the witnesses today, specifically to Mr. Kennedy, a man who has recently claimed that COVID-19 is targeted to attack Caucasians and black people, but tells the black community and myself, a mother of five black children, that I should really be careful and not necessarily have the same safeguards to protect my family my children from a virus that has killed millions of people because I'm black. I move that we move into executive session because Mr. Kennedy has repeatedly made despicable anti-Semitic and anti-Asian comments as recently as last week. Okay, so what that means is they wanted to take it out of the public sphere and put it in an executive meeting room where we wouldn't be able to watch what he said. Well, that didn't happen. They tabled that motion. And then R.F. Kennedy Jr. said this. If the views that you and others 
have applied to me, I've attributed to me, if they were actually true, I can see why I shouldn't be able to testify here today. Those are not true. These are defamations and mal malignancies that are used to censor me, to prevent people from listening to the actual things that I'm saying. And I think, ranking member, that we should have a real conversation rather than an exchange of ad hominem attacks. You know, I was thinking today, who would cheer this on? China, because that's how they roll. Yeah. We're, we're not supposed to roll like that. Um, exactly. And what was so interesting to me is he talked about ad hominem attacks there. This entire hearing is Democrats trying to malign, demonize, and push RFK Jr. out of the way. But where did this all begin? Why are we even having this hearing? You go to page, I think it's eight or nine of the lawsuit uh, that the judge said, Biden, no, you can't censor people. We're going to stop these meetings from happening. There was a digital director named Clark Humphrey, three days into Biden's administration, who sends this email to Twitter. Um, can we keep an eye out for Twitter? tweets that fall into this genre, and he sends RFK Jr.'s tweet. Mm. Hey, folks, wanted to flag below tweet and wondering if we can get moving on the process of having it removed ASAP. So three days in, Biden says, get the RFK Jr. tweet so, off Twitter. He'd go on to be a political rival. So, Sean, I, I try to, to give people the, the space and grace to maybe they didn't know that then. Do you think they knew he was coming? <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. Exactly. You think he was going to, that they knew he was going to knock on the door to get into the White House and try and possibly I, run? I, I think they had to. And so here's a, here's a Democrat candidate who has 20% of the Democrat primary vote. I mean, he's not, he's not a small player. He's a huge player in a, in, in a race against the president of the United States, um, number one. But number two, it's a really good point. He's pushing back on the government using agency to have someone else censor in, some, in, a, in a censorship game that they can't play themselves. Um, it's, it's fascinating. So, I, listen, I love that the Republicans have given him the platform. And by the way, just a reminder, this is what Democrats used to stand for. This is like an old Bill Clinton-esque policies that, that mm. RFK is talking about. Um, not this new left-wing leftism, Marxism that's come from the Democrats. Actually, I think Democrats are very nervous about RFK Jr. And I was looking at a Quinnipiac poll this morning. He's got 14 percent against an incumbent in the White House, the Democratic big. Party. That is a big number. That's double digits. But, you know, Hakeem Jeffries, about an hour ago, made these comments. That, that what I think this is where you see how worried they are. Yep. This is Hakeem Jeffries. Robert F. Kennedy is a living, breathing, false flag operation. His campaign <laughs> is being run by right-wing political operatives who joke. have one objective, take down President Joe Biden. You're nervous, aren't Who's you? Who's the right-wing operative yeah. running his campaign? I'd love to know. Uh, me too. So, but, but that's also something similar to what the left is saying about no labels, the third party. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want any competition whatsoever, no matter where it's coming from, from Joe Biden. But the one that, that really hit me today was when they were trying to tear him apart, some of the congressmen and women who were, you know, had their five minutes on the clock. And it was brought up that he was racist and that, you know, the Tuskegee project, that his comments about vaccines would then keep blacks from getting a vaccine. And it was an emotional moment when he said, you know, my, my family members, remember who his uncle was, JFK, signed the end of the Tuskegee experiments. He goes, I, I was already born then. I mean, the legacy of the bipartisan victories in this country, he's bringing up. He's talking about a time when they all used to get along, and he's talking about his family's sort of place in history. Mm -hmm. And it pretty much shut the conversation. Yeah, and it's telling that Democrats would rather attack him personally than actually deal with the substance of the hearing, which oh, was the weaponization of the government part. against free speech. And it used to be, we don't have to agree with everything that RFK says. We don't have to think that all of his ideas are good. But it used to be that the way that you flesh out the bad ideas is by publicly debunking and debating them. Now, all the Democrats want to do is shut down speech entirely. They don't want to give him a platform. And perhaps it is because they're worried that he poses a significant threat to President Joe Biden. The collusion is already in the courts, and the Biden administration is already losing in the courts over their, their attempting to censor social media. So oh. let's talk about facts here versus theatrics. Yeah. So maybe his rise now in the polls looks like that Jason Aldean song, looks like the Barbie movie. The more you <laughs> talk about it and put it out there, you're helping them out. Maybe they're nervous about that on the left, too. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.
fallout today after that explosive te testimony from a pair of whistleblowers. And we'll get to that in a moment. Before we go forward with that, Jason, I do want to get your take on what's happening on Capitol Hill. And we will dip back into that meeting momentarily. Um, it, I, I, first of all, I never thought the Democrats would go after a Kennedy. I never thought I'd see that day. But unbelievable that they would, in a, in a, a literally a hearing about censorship, they would try to censor this witness. That is unbelievable to me. They interrupted him. They wouldn't let him speak. They wanted to move to executive session. They did everything they could to censor a guy who was there to testify about censorship. Look, not to take us too far into the weeds, but I want to understand. When a Democratic Congresswoman, Stacey Plaskett of the Virgin Islands, says that she wants to take a meeting out of the public eye, into an executive forum. What does that mean exactly? Well, she's a delegate, but she is the ranking member. Um, executive session is reserved solely for those things that are classified. If, if you have something that's highly classified or perhaps pornographic to the point of uh, child pornography and those types of things, those two categories would allow you to move to executive session. It's subject to a vote. But what she's really trying to say is she's trying to take his words down. She's trying mm -hmm. to censor him before he's even spoken. That's what she's trying to do. Look, at the end of the day, what people want to know is what these witnesses, and he's on a list of witnesses, have to say about what this current administration is doing to step on free speech. And then what we see is in full display a Democratic congresswoman, ranking member of this committee, stepping on free speech. Monsters. Yeah, she she literally is trying to suppress him before he even speaks. And that's what the administration was doing uh, to people like Kennedy, who had 900,000 people on Instagram, and they tried to take down his account. They wouldn't allow him to do this. The, the core coordination between the administration and these social media companies, that needs to be exposed in its fullest because they were using the weight of the Department of Justice to lean on these social media companies to encourage them to take down, not something that was against the law, but because they didn't like the political ramifications of what people like Kennedy and others were trying to say. It was wow. mostly on conservatives, but here's a case where they're trying to take Kennedy down, who's asking questions about vaccines. Those were legitimate questions. They should have never been taken down. All right, I want to move forward because uh, there were some other kind of free speech going on. And this had to do also at a hearing that got heated. Uh, fallout today after yesterday's explosive testimony from a couple of whistleblowers, the two IRS employees, one who says he's identifying as a gay Democrat. So he's saying, I don't have a political dog in this fight, describing in detail how the Biden Justice Department interfered with the Hunter tax invasion investigation rather at every turn. Democrats in full meltdown mode as they tried to discredit the whistleblowers and shift the focus to former President Trump. Not in the room, not part of the conversation, but they tried anyway. We can conclude that this Inspector Clouseau-style quest for something that doesn't exist has turned our committee into a theater of the absurd, an exercise in futility and embarrassment. We are here today because Donald Trump is exerting an influence campaign. I don't like these attacks on the Department of Justice, the FBI, the IRS, as if they are somehow anti-U.S. agencies. This is ludicrous. Beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life down here. None. The whistleblowers laid out exactly how Hunter Biden got preferential treatment. Prosecutors deviated from normal procedures and slow walk the investigation against them. They also estimated that Hunter Biden raked in some $17 million in foreign deals that they know about and that the IRS wanted to slap him with much more serious charges than he ultimately faced. In key testimony, they said they were blocked from following up on Hunter Biden's WhatsApp messaging that seemed to directly tie Joe Biden to his son's shady deals. This is another solicitation from Hunter Biden, and he refers to the Bidens, plural, and they're best at doing what the chairman wants. I think that's very concerning to our committee because this is a 
Chinese Communist Party owned entity. Uh, this is of concern to our national security. With respect to the WhatsApp messages, it was something we clearly needed to follow up on, and, th and, and that was really one of the major deviations from, in this case, is that, is that investigators asked, and Special Agent Ziegler asked to follow, uh, uh, to take some investigative steps to review that, and it just simply wasn't supported by the prosecutors. So uh, for d further delving into what that means, uh, I just simply can't do. Well, I can promise you we're not going to stop on this committee until we understand what he fully meant by that message to a uh, Chinese Communist Party official. So, Jason, what do you say about that? The WhatsApp testimony agents not allowed to pursue information on, quote unquote, I'm sitting here with my father, things that would put the two of them in the same room while their business dealings were going on. So you have credible IRS employees that are following the money. They're looking at, uh, you know, potential crimes in, in, in how the, they dealt with these uh, IRS claims, um, falsifying records, doing all sorts of things. But they're not allowed to uh, pursue the, the truth. Uh, they were impeded by the FBI, the Department of Justice. Uh, and, and, and that is the core of this. These people were not allowed to do their jobs. It was an incomplete investigation. You know, Harris, next week, there's, the judge is supposed to consider this plea deal. I don't know how a judge properly rules on a plea deal mm. when you just had congressional testimony from IRS agents saying they were not allowed to complete their investigation. It was purely political, something these people have never seen in their investigative careers. And it directly ties Joe Biden and the Biden family to corruption and money that is flowing from these overseas entities. Remember, they have more than 20 entities no products, no services, and millions of dollars flowing to the Bidens, and yet these guys couldn't go and pursue it to its wow. fullest. I, I mean, and what you're pointing to as well is the fact that um, if, it, if we knew all of this before, would that deal even be in place? The judge could reject it. I've been told by legal experts it would be a rare thing to happen, but we'll cover it yes. and see what that judge does. Real quickly, um, how exactly do we know was the Biden family protected in the investigation? Who was deeply behind it? What, what was learned? Um, I, I think there were very specific. I think when they talked about they met with the prosecutors, they were unanimous in their decision that they were making a recommendation to do it. But the very specific testimony that was given previously in transcribed interviews and there at the witnesses table today, when they said you cannot ask questions about Hunter's dad. You can't ask questions about who the big guy is. You can't ask questions about the $10,000. When they can't ask a simple question, and remember, they never got to interview Hunter Biden because Hunter Biden was yeah. tipped off. When do you ever hear about the IRS <clears throat> getting thwarted in their ability to actually interview witnesses? They couldn't do that in this case. Wow, tipped off. And, and Biden's transition team was tipped off. I'm still, yeah. that's confounding to me, that's, since uh, apparently he didn't know yeah. anything about anything. Uh, good to see you. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts, Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany, on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern, or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights. And one of the things that the BBC the organizers said at the beginning is that you know, this is about saving ourselves, our, our economic models, because we are, you know, most people look at us and they say CNN and BBC are competitors, but we aren't. The real competition is coming from these thousands of emerging mm -hmm. alternative media sites that are eroding trust in the, in the legacy sites and are taking away our, our business model. And we need to bond together. I'm Dave Rubin, and joining me today is an environmental lawyer, author, and candidate for President of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Finally, welcome to the Rubin Report. Dave, thanks for having me. Sorry it took me so long. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad to have you. And uh, with all the media stuff you've been going through over the last couple of weeks, you've given us plenty to talk about. First off, though, you usually do these interviews uh, sitting in your library. Am I getting the uh, the special office interview or what's I, going on here? I'm in a hotel room in New York City. 
Hotel in New York. I'll take it. All right. So let's dive into it. I, I thought before we get into some of the specifics uh, and all the media stuff that's been happening and everything else, um, I was once a Democrat. And uh, when we talk about you on my show, people often ask, uh, Dave, what makes RFK a Democrat at this point? This isn't 1960, 1970, 1980. So I guess that's my first question to you. What, what sort of lines you up with the modern Democrat Party at this point? Well, I don't, uh, I, I, my, my uh, loyalty and affiliation and affinity for the Democratic Party um, is, you know, for the party that I grew up with. And uh, I think, you know, what's happening in the party today is unfortunate. I do think the party, I do believe the party is redeemable ultimately. Um, so, uh, and I think our country is redeemable. And I think we need both of those things to happen. You know, if you go, if you went through a checklist, Dave, of all of the things that my, uh, my uncle, John Kennedy, my father, Robert Kennedy, believed in, and Edward Kennedy believed in, you would, I would kind of check probably every item on the list. Um, whereas today you know some of the issues that the democratic party has embraced are things that i'm uncomfortable with and i think a lot of people around the country are and, I, and a lot of the traditional base of the democratic party which was working people's unions uh, american middle class um and now more and more uh Minorities, uh, blacks and Hispanics are moving away from the Democratic Party because they feel that they've been neglected and that the party is not representing their um, their interests anymore or their values. What do you think the best way to sort of separate what I would consider the old school classical liberals, guys like you and, and your uncle and your father, uh, from what's going on with, with the more radical progressive branch? Well, you know, I just talk, I, I try not to talk um, about, you know, I, I try not to badmouth anybody. You know, I, I think there's been enough of that in this country and people are, are done with it. And we need to find a, a path back to uh, civility and to end this very, very toxic polarization. So I try not to you know, condemn other people. And I just, I talk about the things that I believe in, which are the traditional values of the Democratic Party. I try to find, uh, and I've always done this, try to, to identify the values that we have in common rather than focusing on the, um, the issues that hold us apart. You know, I, I spent 35 years as a, uh, as kind of with one of the leading environmental champions in this country, but I was speaking regularly, probably doing 60 big speeches a year to mainly Republican groups, and I was getting uh, standing ovations in most of them because I didn't focus on the issues. Like, you know, there's no such thing as Republican children or Democratic children. Mm -hmm. We all want a clean environment. And yet it be, had become a very partisan issue. So I tried to talk about the environment in a way uh, that, you know, that every American could embrace. And I, I think most of us, 80 percent of us, agree on 99 on percent of the issues. Yeah. Have you been shocked at the way the media has been treating you? Because you've been out there basically talking to everybody, having open conversations. You're talking to people on the right. You're talking to people on the left, and the media has gone after you in an absolutely crazy way. I, I wanna read one headline to you. It's about your wife, who I adore, and uh, we were sort of in similar circles when I lived in LA, and I love Curb, but this headline that I'm sure you saw from the New York Times, Cheryl Hines, the Curb Your Enthusiasm actress, is beloved in Hollywood. Now she's supporting the presidential campaign of her husband, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Is she normalizing his often dangerous ideas. I actually retweeted it and I asked people to come up with some of your dangerous ideas and, and nobody seems to really know what they are, but that doesn't stop the New York Times. Yeah, and all of my conspiracy theories, as it turns out, have come true. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, they're no longer theories. They're, you know, they're now uh, proven hypotheses. But 
But you know what? I, I do wonder about it. I, you know, I was thinking about this this morning, <clears throat> that I'm, because the, the, this kind of this hailstorm of negative publicity about me really kind of not, it goes beyond like hit pieces to be just this, you know, poisonous vitriol. Um, and that it's coming from all the legacy media, from the Atlantic Monthly, from New York Magazine, mm-hmm. from New Yorker, from the Washington Post, from the New York Times, from Vanity Fair, Daily Beast, uh, Daily Coast, Rolling Stone, and and many, many others. And they all kind of use the same talking points, and uh, and they also are not accurate. You know, none of them has really written an accurate and it, that's one of the reasons it doesn't trouble me is because it's it's just um, it's just inaccuracies, and m- distortions, mischaracterizations. Um, but one of the things that kind of occurred to me is that there's something bigger at play there than just their kind of hatred of me. Um, that this is it's I feel like I'm kind of on the spear tip of a war between the this declining. Uh, legacy media mm-hmm. and the evolving and emerging uh, and new media, the podcasters, the you know all of these alternative news sites, and I'm in a litigation right now against an organization called the TNI, the Trusted News Initiative. The Trusted News Initiative was a uh, was a conspiracy that was initiated by BBC where they called together all of the legacy news sites, including API, the American Associated Press, Reuters, um, the UPI, the Washington Post, and many, many others. And they married them to the social media sites, to Microsoft, to uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter. And they all made an agreement with each other that they would censor certain kinds of information. For example, any information about COVID that departed from government orthodoxies, but also information that challenged any kind of political orthodoxies, like any reports on Hunter Biden's laptop, Mm -hmm. uh, reports about the Ukraine war that were were inconsistent with the official U.S. positions. And this was an extraordinary thing. This has never happened before. But we obtained during the litigation the internal communications, and one of the things that the BBC the organizers said at the beginning is that, you know, this is about saving ourselves, our our economic models, because we are, you know, most people look at us and they say CNN and BBC are competitors, but we aren't. The real competition is coming from these thousands of emerging Mm -hmm. alternative media sites that are eroding trust in the in the legacy sites and are taking away our our business model. And we need to bond together. And so the way it worked was that they would all identify issues and identify individuals who were saying things that should be censored. They would notify each other of those um, of those posts or those articles and of those individuals. They would censor them, and then the social media sites would not allow those the sites that printed them on. Mm-hmm. So, if you were, you know, a Green Med Info, which is a, you know a, a site that, that provides wellness information, or Joe Mercola, or one of these sites. These others are Breitbart or somebody who was departing from government orthodoxies, you would find yourself banned on social media. And those sites absolutely require social media for their business models. So if they if you prevent them from going viral, the, the way their business model works is they put in articles, they print articles that, or publish articles that then go viral. That's the only way that they grow, that they earn, you know, that they can earn advertising dollars. So if you cut them off there, and this is what the memo from BBC said, we need to choke off those sites. So they wanted to kill all those sites. And they did it by agreeing on a single narrative, which was the official government narrative, and then censoring or ridiculing, you know, or, or throttling or shadow banning. 
anybody who uh, who challenged those orthodoxies. So you have the you know the legacy media, which traditionally was functioning as guardians of the First Amendment of free expression. They were you know they, they were supposed to courageously speak truth to power, maintain. This is posture of fear, skepticism towards big, uh, big aggregations of power, government, corporations, and they now become the opposite. They become propagandists for the powerful and oppressors of uh, of you know of free speech and the enemies of the First Amendment. And that you know, I find myself, I you know, I now see myself as a spear tip of this emerging media which is in an economic competition, but also kind of an ideological, you know, Armageddon with the old media sites. And, you know, so I'm being championed by Russell Brand and by Joe Rogan and by, you know, uh, Lex Friedman and all of these, you know, kind of alternative media giants uh, in a battle. And I think they see that as well. Russell Brand said to me something about that the other day that sent me thinking, you know, about how they need to, uh, uh, those sites really need to understand where we all are in this, where they are in this world of, you know, of, uh, of disruption of the old, uh, of the old business model. Right. And it's really bizarre because even now when they've been so frequently exposed for the censorship, your interview with my friend Jordan Peterson from about two weeks ago was taken down on YouTube and then they put it up on Rumble and now you're on Rumble and they're not censoring anybody. Uh, but what, what do you think about, uh, so what would you do? So, so if you were president of the United States, what would you do in terms of big tech? Is it, is it breaking them up? Is it regulating them? How do you connect that to what you just described with the legacy media that's offering, you know, that's usually pushing the pressure on big tech to do these things? And then of course the connections we now know with the CIA and FBI and everything else. Yeah, well, more and more, you know, we're beginning to understand, and this, you know, the judicial decision this week by Judge Doge in, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the Missouri and Louisiana uh, Attorney General's cases, um, I think really lays it out that um, that the social media sites were kind of victims as well of of the censorship because. They were, and I was, you know, I'm in judge, the, the, the decision is 155 pages, and it's a decision that forbids the Biden White House from having any contact with social media sites. It's this extraordinary injunction, and it's, I think it's bulletproof. I think that's why he did this, you know, 155-page decision, because he wanted to lay out the evidence. And he talks about the history, about how the Biden administration um, initiated this this, uh, this censorship uh, push, uh, blitzkrieg, um, and a, I was the first one that they ordered censored. Oh, the Biden administration came into office on January twenty first, twenty twenty one. On January twenty third, they contacted Facebook, the White House contacted Facebook, and asked them to start to remove me. Hmm. And then three weeks later, there was a battle. The the people in the White House were threatening Facebook with, with withdrawal of their Section 230 immunity, mm -hmm. which is existential threat to them. The Section 230, of course, is a the liability shield, so that you know if you defamed uh, you know Donald Trump on Facebook and said something that was untrue, that you knew to be untrue, that was scurrilous and very damaging, he can sue you, but he can't sue Facebook. Facebook is, an, is supposed to be a neutral platform, and it cannot be sued, and that's called Section 230. Mark Zuckerberg said, if we lose that, it's existential. We cease to exist. And so right. they would actually have to censor more in that case because they would have more liability. So they'd be tr basically censoring everybody. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they would need to read every they would have to have lawyers read every single post and assess it for, you know, for defamation. There would be no way to do right. it. It would just collapse. So. Um, so and that's what the White House was threatening. If you don't censor these guys, we're going to withdraw your Section 230 immunity. So the White House was strong arming them in the most powerful way. 
to censor. And then the White House invited in all of these agencies, the really weird agencies like the Census Bureau. I mean, the CIA was involved. The FBI was involved. The DH had the Department of Homeland Security was involved. But also, like the IRS and uh, and the Census Bureau and a, a whole bunch of other agencies were all involved in identifying people that needed to be censored. And the things they were censoring were really crazy. You know, it was the same thing that TNI was censoring, like Hunter Biden's laptop. You weren't allowed to talk about that. But anything to do with the Wuhan lab, you couldn't talk about. Um, but also personal attacks on the president. There was a parody of the president and his wife um, that uh, that they ordered taken down. So this is, you know, really, this is like King George III, you know, back, mm-hmm. back in the revolution. This is the reason we had the revolution was that, and put the First Amendment in place so that the, the king or the, you know, ruler could not silence critics because if government can silence its critics, it's, it has license for any atrocity. So, so what would your policy be? Would it be that you'd I break would, up some of these companies or would it be that you'd be regulating them or... Uh, Let them collapse. What I um, first of all, on day one, I'm going to I'm going to issue executive orders forbidding forbidding uh, any uh, federal agency from engaging in censorship activities or recommendations or contacts with these companies regarding posts that they don't like. There's, of course, things that should be removed from the Internet, you know, but they're, they're, it's unprotected speech. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, pedophilia and, uh, um, and you know, uh, inciting violence and, you know, those kind of things you, you can censor without, without violating the First Amendment because they're not more fraudulent. Right. They're, they're illegal. Yeah, they're illegal and they're not protected by the First Amendment. But otherwise, I'm going to order them all. Not only am I going to order them to stop censoring, but I'm going to basically, with you know, uh, reinstate the Smith Month Month Act, which has been effectively just forgotten about and abandoned. That forbids um, the federal agencies from propagandizing American people. And that is just as frightening what's happening now with, the, you know, active propaganda by the CIA through all of these legitimate media sites um, of our, you know, of debates about the Ukraine war and about things that Americans should not be propagandized about. You know, we should we should know who, you know, I think everybody should be able to talk about these things, but we should know who it is talking we shouldn't have the CIA running reporters and Rolling Stone and uh, Daily Coast and Daily Beast and telling us, you know, pretending that they're neutral reporters. How worried are you that what Trump describes as the swamp or what you're just, you know, the CIA, the three letter agencies, all, the deep state, all of this stuff that that going against it and talking about it the way you talk about it, which is somewhat similar to the way Trump talks about it, that it's it's a machine that is so embedded, or as your uncle used to talk about, the, that secrecy cannot be a piece of a, of a flourishing democracy. But it's so embedded in everything right now, all of our agencies, all of our institutions, ESG, all of these things, that it actually can't change that much. It, it would, you know, you can go in and you can do executive actions and all that, but somehow the system, the swamp just keeps moving forward. Yeah, I don't believe that. I, I uh, you know, I'm very excited about having an opportunity to fix it. I've spent, and I think I'm uniquely um, positioned to do that because I've spent 40 years suing these agencies and thinking about how do you unravel agency capture. And, you know, I've sued, I've had suits involving almost all of the major a- agencies, uh, NIH, CDC, FDA, uh, HHS, and then the, the uh, Department of Agriculture, because I've spent, I spent 20 years suing factory farms and, and, you know, big processed food producers. And I saw how that agency has been taken over by industrial agriculture and, you know, has completely drifted away from its mission of protecting small family farmers and providing... Mm-hmm. America a wholesome food supply. I'm involved now with litigation that involves the Department of Transportation. I'm, you know, I'm representing a thousand families in the 
Norfolk Southern spill that, you know, upended their lives. And that spill happened because of agency capture. And many of these agencies, I've, you know, and of course, I've, probably 20% of the 500 environmental cases that I've been involved with um, have, involved, have been against EPA. Um, you know, which is captured by the pesticide industry, by the um, by the uh, oil and coal industry. When I sued Monsanto, we came across emails, um, secret emails that Monsanto had exchanged with the head of the pesticide division, a guy called Jess Rowland, who was taking a federal paycheck and supposedly working for the taxpayer, but secretly he was working uh, for Monsanto. And this is the problem, is that most of the people who work at these agencies are well-intentioned individuals, they're patriots, they're good government employees, good public servants. But the people who tend to rise to the top and become the division heads, the branch heads, and of course, you know, the directors of those departments um, are are people who are in the, are in the tank with the industry. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they, you know, set the tone and... He set the agenda for the whole. So I, I need to go in there and and, and do that. You know, I, I've spent a lot of my life studying the CIA because my family's uh, sixty-year fist fight with that agency. I know how my uncle was going to try to reorganize the agency if he hadn't been killed. I know exactly what my father was going to do with the agency. In fact, he had a long conversation with it a week before he died with Pete Hamill, who's my friend, who's uh, you know was a reporter who was covering him. And I don't think it's a hard thing to do. You need to you know you need to get rid of the perverse incentives, these financial entanglements that the agencies have with the, the industries they're supposed to regulate. You need to move around certain individuals, and then you need to put in place really good um, uh, laws against uh, against revolving doors, which is part of the problem. You know, people work for twenty years for the federal government for one of these agencies, and they're uh, and as soon as their pension vests. They move over to the industry that they've been regulating, and so they want mm-hmm. a good job. And a lot of them are the heads of departments now, and they end up doing a bunch of favors for these companies right before they leave, and in order to get the paybacks. And I can give you example after example of that. But we need, you know, right now they just have to wait twelve months. We need a five-year wait uh, to make sure to get rid of those revolving doors. And, uh, you know, but I think it can be fixed, Dave. I, you know, I'm very confident. That's something I'm very, very excited about doing. And I'm going to go to the agencies myself. You know, I'm going to go to Bethesda and I'm going to go, you know, to the EPA and I'm going to, you know, um, I'm going to have direct uh, interactions with those agencies and make sure that the and to the State Department, which is now run from top to bottom by neocons, who are, you know, whose job is to k- keep us involved in these constant wars. And we need to move those people out and, uh, you know, and reinst- re- re- reinstall the integrity in those agencies and the public purpose. So I sense you have a you see a bit of a connection between, say, some of the coverage that you get in places like the New York Times and your criticism of uh, the agencies and things like that. Like, you see this as sort of one insidious web, which I think is deeply also connected to the Democrat Party these days. I mean, the fact that you're polling in some places over 20 percent right now and they are making it very, very clear that they're not going to put you on a debate stage. I mean, a lot of Democrats... I think are not happy about this. I know a lot of Republicans are not happy about it and they're happy to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, one, one of the things I said in my, um, in my speech, my announcement speech in Boston is that the people who are normally put in charge of these agencies, and, and this was what Trump did too, you know, Trump came in and he promised to to drain the swamp. And then, you know, he put me, he named me as head of the Vaccine Safety Commission. And I started that function. I met with Fauci. I met with Collins and was putting together that, you know, project. And then uh, when that news got out, Pfizer gave a million dollar contribution to Trump. And 
Uh, and Trump appointed two Pfizer's handpicked candidates, Alex Azar, to run HHS, and Scott Gottlieb, who was a partner of Pfizer, to run FDA. Yeah. And, you know, Gottlieb yeah. came in there, uh, did an $88 billion gift to uh, Operation Warp Speed for, for, for Pfizer, and then left to join Pfizer's board and get it, collect his payoff. So, you know, that is the swamp. And, and uh, you know, uh, people come in wanting to change it, but they get intimidated by these big agencies and they, um, uh, and they you know, get frightened because, yeah, the agency can hurt you. You know, if you go after that agency, there's a lot of top-level officials in there who can commit all kinds of civil disobediences that will embarrass the president. And so what they do is they appoint somebody who's safe. They look at the agency, they say, I'd like to change that, but I got other agendas. So they leave the whole, you know, instrument of corruption intact and they appoint somebody who's safe. And that person, you know, Ralph Reed once said to me, the guys who get those jobs are the guys who, who, who get the joke. You know, and, uh, <laughs> right, I, right. What I said in my announcement speeches, I get the joke, but I don't think it's funny. You know, right, and, exactly. And, and I'm not safe. No, I'm not. You know, I'm my job is to keep the American people safe. Uh, but I'm not going to be safe with the status quo. I, I'm going to be the worst nightmare for the status quo. So for all the people that hear you, the independents, the what I would say are the remaining sort of old school liberals and for even some conservatives who are open to a lot of these ideas and a lot of the stuff you're talking about, it's, it's sort of Trumpian in a certain sense. It's stuff that Tucker Carlson talks about. I want to get to the Ukraine war in a second. Um, but what would you what's the way to get you on that stage so that there can be a debate between you and Joe Biden? Because to me, the, the difference would be so stark that that could start the avalanche like that seems to be the chance what, what can you do with the democrat party in essence is what we, i'm asking you know i think we need to go the democratic party into to, into a debate i mean we're we're at a period in history where you know so many americans no longer believe in the political process they think it's rigged against them and you know the democratic party and the republican party ought to be doing their best to showcase gold standard elections and to tell you know the American people democracy counts, your vote counts, your opinion counts, and we're actually going to do retail campaigning. We're going to have debates. We're going to you know we're not going to be like the Soviet Union where you know where the party would pick the candidate and tell you you know here's who you vote for and there's no real contest going on and no real choice. This is America. We're, we, you know, we model democracy for the world. We should have a model, you know, a role model election in this country. And, you know, let's, you know, we need to tell Joe Biden, and, you know, to embrace the ideals that he stood for for his whole career and not end his career by, you know, tarring our country with a, with a, you know, with a rigged election. This. The Democrat. Are, are you in any contact with the Democrat Party? I mean, have you uh, have they specifically said we're not going to? I mean, I'm guessing they don't pick up your calls, right? Uh, no, we're not, not in contact with them. I mean, they've you know been very clear that they don't want me in this election. I hear it from people all the time. You know, why don't you? Um, you know, you could hurt Joe Biden. You know, again, and get Trump elected. Um, you know, people say that to me a lot. You know, people who are in the party or. Uh, you know, I ran into Hillary Clinton at a dinner uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she said something like that to me along those lines. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's strange because most, um, I don't think anybody is happy with the choices that Americans are being given right now. And I think, you know, we need... Some other choices. I'm glad Marianne Williamson is in this race. I hope uh, Gavin Newsom gets into it. I think, you know, we need choices. We need, we, we can't just have a kabuki theater, you know, democracy. We, we, need, we need a real, uh, you know, we're supposed to be, the Democrats Great. are supposed to be the party of the New Deal, not the party of the rake deal. And that's... Uh, I have to, my audience, my audience will go crazy if I don't say something, though, about Gavin Newsom, because he 
to me is exactly why I'm no longer a Democrat. The reason I literally fled California because of him, high taxes, endless regulation, lockdowns, keeping his winery open. Like, so I'm, I'm with you that you need a diverse, broad coalition of people and different ideas and all that stuff. But that guy, I, I just, yeah, I would be remiss you, if I did not say that. But, but I love that because I, that's what I want to run. I want to have that discussion with him. I want to sit on a stage and say exactly what you just said, because, you know, we should have all the right. working people involved in this debate. You know, I want people who I don't agree with. And I also want to say that show that we can have a civil discussion with each other, even though, you know, that, well, you know, even though we have these profound disagreements, you know, I, there's nobody who disagrees more with the way, the way that um, that Gavin uh, Newsom ran uh, the COVID operation. And, and, you know, I was in San Francisco this week. And I spent, like, I guess uh, almost uh, nine months in, in San Francisco during the, the Monsanto trials. So, you know, I, I got to know the city really well and love the city. And the courthouse is near enough Union Square that I could walk down to Union Square every morning. And you had, you know, Union Square, for people who don't know San Francisco, is like the Fifth Avenue of San Francisco. It's where all mm -hmm. the shops, you know, Armani and Nordstrom's and uh, Banana Republic and Gap and and all of these, you know, powerful, iconic American corporations. The showcase of American retail might is right there, you know, Levi's and and uh, and, and all of the and it is it is Fifth Avenue West. And I went down there three weeks ago, and every one of those shops is closed, every one of them. And, it, you know, these are huge buildings and giant malls and retail, and they're just closed. They're boarded up because they, you know, they just let, they, they let them languish during these lockdowns that just destroyed the city. There's a 30 or 35% vacancy rate. And there's no way that they're, you know, I don't even, even understand any conception of how they can bring that city back. You know, you need somebody, I don't know, you need some very, very powerful dynamic character who can come in and, and convince these retailers that, you know that the policies are going to change, and that they they can take a risk on California, on on San Francisco again, and that's all Gavin Newsom. And I want to talk to him about that. I want to talk on a stage, you know, about what do you think that's good for America? You know, are you happy? what do you? Yeah, what do you make of the people that now are refusing to talk to you? Because look, I, I'm with you. I, I would love for you to have that conversation with Newsom. I I, I think he's. He's, I mean, he destroyed San Francisco as mayor, as you're pointing out, and then he destroyed the, the state, in essence, California as governor. Uh, but, you know, it's not just him. I mean, you know, Jake Tapper went on CNN, what was it, about 10 days ago, and said he would not have you on the show because of your dangerous misinformation. There was obviously the, this famous thing with uh, Dr. Peter Hotez on, uh, you know, telling Rogan that he'll no longer do the show and he won't even, he won't debate you. By the way, I then had Brett Weinstein and uh, Jay Bhattacharya offer to debate Hotez, he won't debate them either. But this notion that you're out there saying, hey, I'll talk to you guys, and now they've framed you as, oh, he's untouchable, as if something you've said is so crazy. Yeah, I mean, if you can't debate it, it's not science. Let, let's, you know, it, the science is, is rooted in reason and logic, and, um, and, you know, scientists are supposed to be able to subject themselves to the, you know, to the furnace of debate. And you know, allow the you know the, the their ideas to triumph in the in the to become annealed in debate, and, and then to triumph and rise in the marketplace of ideas. And if you can't do that, I mean, they say, well, because I'm a fraud, and a quack, and a charlatan, and all the other you know things that they say about me, that you know you can't debate somebody like that. Well, that, that's a bunch of. First of all. You know, I've I've won hundreds and hundreds of cases by arguing in front of juries and, you know, with people who if I was making these kind of, you know, absurd claims and, you know, if I was the kind of person that was making those kind of claims that were baseless, 
uh, that the other attorneys in those cases would chew me up and spit me out mm-hmm. and humiliate mm-hmm. me in front of the jury because that's what we are trained to do. And so, you know, I, I Hota has told the truth one time with Rogan. Is two or three years ago, Rogan said, "Why don't you debate uh, Bobby Kennedy?" And he said, "Well, he's a cunning lawyer, and you know, I'm not trained with debate." Well, you know, every scientist is is a, you look at what Darwin did and what you know, mm-hmm. uh, what, and even like Archimedes and you know all of the, 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 the Galileo and all these they had to defend their ideas. I mean, there are forums set up all over the world where scientists get together and, uh, you know, and debate each other. And those debates are, are vicious and they're, uh, and they're you know, for them, very, very high stakes debate. Um, and, they're, uh, and they use every trick, but that's part of being a scientist. Is you take your ideas and you, and you give them and, you know, the way that what I would do with Hodes is that I really have a lot of domain knowledge about vaccine uh, studies. I, you know, I've written books about them. I've assembled them. Um, and so I would, you know, my my way of debating would be ask, asking him, showing him the studies and saying, you know, how can you explain this? If what you're saying is true, show me your study. By the way, I've had private debates with Hodes. So I probably spent, I don't know, 10 or 20 hours with him uh, because a few years ago, um, somebody asked me, I, somebody who I was, with whom I was very close told me they were going to come out publicly against me with vaccination, and this person is very wired in at NIH, and I said, before you do that, put me in a room with a guy who knows more about vaccines than anybody in the world. And you listen to me debate them and then make up your mind about whether or not you want to go public against me. And so he called Francis Collins and Francis Collins and Tony Fauci. And they didn't want to do it, but they said the guy to do it is Peter Hotez. So he is their, you know, their champion. He's, uh, he's their Goliath. And so Hote has got, did a series of phone calls with me and this other individual. And uh, the, let me just say this, the, the individual did not come out publicly against me after listening to those debates. Hmm. But we then had a lot of email exchanges where I would say, show me the study that shows that vaccines don't cause, all, that, that, that any of the vaccines given the first six months of life don't, give, uh, don't cause autism. He ended up sending me 11 studies about the MMR vaccine, which is not, does not fit in that category. And the mm-hmm. Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, those studies don't exist. I showed him those papers. So, um, you know, his, I don't think his fear is that I would say something that was sort of crazy and detached from reality. I think his fear is that I would expose reality. Right. I mean, that that's the point. Like, it's not like you're some random kook on the street. It's like if you were saying crazy things, he should be able uh, to debunk them. L- let's hit a couple other uh, topics. Um, the affirmative action decision came out uh, a week or so ago from the Supreme Court. And, you know, I've been on board so much of what you're saying, even though, as I said, I, I'm, I don't consider myself a Democrat. I moved to Florida. It's the first time I've ever registered as a Republican since I've been here in Florida. Um, but I saw your, your tweet thread about the affirmative action decision, and basically you were, you were against the decision. Uh, and I was hoping maybe you could just walk us through the, the philosophy there. Yeah, and I understand why people, um, you know, differ about that with me, and a lot of the people who have supported me on other issues uh, would be disappointed by that. But, you know, that, um, listen, I grew up in a state um, that was a Jim Crow state. So uh, when I grew up in Virginia, I, um, you know, it was illegal at that time for a black man to marry a white woman. Uh, every aspect of life was governed by considerations of race. Um, you were identified by black on your birth certificate. 
you were raised in a black neighborhood, you attended segregated, black segregated schools, you transportation, public parks, um, everything, every aspect. You were you were identified by race on your death certificate and buried in a, a black cemetery. I had a, a, a guy, there was a guy who worked for, at, for my family and I, from when I was young, I was going hunting and, and trapping hawks down in the southern part of Virginia. And he would carry me on those trips. And he had been a World War II vet. He, he was in the CBs. He was six foot five, incredibly smart. And when we stopped in restaurants, I would have to go in and buy the food and bring it out so that the two of us could eat it in the car. He asked me one day to accompany him on a um, into the, the local shoe store because he was not allowed in the shoe store. He had to, I had to buy the shoes from him, bring them out side and he had to try them on the curb oh you know when i and then my my family was you know deeply involved in the civil rights movement and uh and you know a lot of people look at affirmative action and say well you know it's been a it's been a, a hundred 150 years since, since the civil war you know uh, people have had black americans have had time to recover um but you know I was, uh, you know, I I saw what it was like to be black when I was a kid. I saw that, you know, that, that all of those higher levels of society were forbidden, right, you know, in my lifetime. And my family was deeply involved in ending that system of Jim Crow. And part of, um, of you know, of that process was doing something that normally I wouldn't believe in, which is... Uh, which is allowing, you know, uh, uh, considerations of race to uh, to affect the judgments about who gets these, you know, positions in colleges. But I also know, Dave, that almost all of those colleges already have a system of preference, and the system of preference is for legacies, you know, for people like me who had a grandfather went to Harvard, a father went to Harvard, uncles that went there, and so I, it's much easier for me to get in. But all of those legacies and also the, the, um, the, the offspring of faculty are given preferences. And if you look at a, a pie chart, or who's in almost none of those kids are black. So this is kind of a way of counterbalancing that, and it's not, you know, Believe me, I have a lot of problems with it, too. And I, let, let me tell you what the problems are that I see with affirmative action. Is One, it's just contrary to American values that, you know, that we're a meritocracy. It's an illusion, though, as I say, that we're a meritocracy because there are all these built-in biases and preferences. But also, I think that the, the bigger problem is what Barack Obama calls um, uh, you know, the, the, the subtle bigotry of low expectations um, that, you know, people, a, a black kid in a college, in a good college, that people are looking at that kid and saying, uh, oh, he got in here because he got a preference. And I don't think that's good for America either. So I understand that, that you know, I, I think the Supreme Court has made a decision that debate is now over about affirmative action. We're moving on, and we're going to, you know, try to preserve the um, the beachhead that Black Americans got during that period in faculty positions, in business positions, etc. Um, but uh, you know, f for me, I would say that we probably should have kept it in place for a few more years. But um, you know, it's over now. Right. I, I get the intentions. Just just one more on that. What, what what would you say in that case to the kid, the, say, 16 or 17 year old Asian kid who, you know, scored perfect on his SATs and had all A's and, you know, he knows he's not getting into Harvard because someone with significantly less grades is going to get in. No one gave that Asian kid anything. He might be second American from South Korea and his parents owned a bodega. That was a lot of kids that I grew up around. I mean, what do you say to that kid? I think that's what that's what the nugget really comes down to here. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think that's a, it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's not an easy position on any side to take, but, um, you know, as far as that Asian kid goes, there's kids getting into that college because they're good at sports who don't have that kind of academic, um, 
you know, discipline or uh, academic uh, performance record. So there's all kinds of biases that get certain people in, and um, and you know, and and it, it it's not a mer- it's not a straight meritocracy. There's no college. There there are very few colleges in this country. I'm not going to say no. It just look at your GPA and your you know and your test scores and say that the, the top you know three thousand kids with the best test scores in the country are the kids that are going to get into this college. They're, all the decisions are uh, are dripping with bias of one kind or another. So um, and unfortunately, the bias you know these studies show that the biases tend to reflect the racial composition of the admissions department. That they, you know, people tend to favor people who look like them and give them a preference. And, you know, a lot of the admissions departments didn't have black people in them. And so, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's not an easy question, Dave. It's not one that I will, you know, I'm, uh, I, it's one that's inconsistent with a lot of my other values and ideas about the country, but uh, you know, because of my background and um, and uh, I, you know, I, I land on that side. Yeah, I, I think I think that's as fair uh, or as honest an answer as you can give. I personally, I happen to disagree, but but that's that's just fine. That's the point of all of this. Yeah. Um, let, let's hit a couple other things. So so Ukraine war. Uh, there seems to have been this odd flip amongst the parties. When I was growing up, again, as a Democrat in New York and my family, we all considered ourselves JFK Democrats, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Ed Koch, probably many of the, the you know, people that you literally grew up around, but that you were your ideological heroes as well. Um, the Democrats were sort of the anti-war party. That was at least the notion. And it was the Republicans and the neocons who then wanted to nation build and all of these things. We seem to have had a flip on that. Now, I get there are plenty of Republicans that are for this Ukraine war as well, but it does seem to be being driven more by the Democrat Party, at least because Biden is in office. What what do we do? Well, first off, I guess, do you think that's a fair uh, estimation? And then what do we do about this to get ourselves out of this before World War III comes? Yeah, and it's getting to a crazy point right now where we're now, you know, the Biden administration a year ago said that uh, when they were called on to send cluster bombs to Israel, the Biden administration, Jen Psaki said, use of cluster bombs was a war crime. Yep. Yesterday, President Biden announced that they're sending cluster bombs to uh, to Russia. And meanwhile, they're telling the American people that we're winning the war. Cluster bombs are a last resort resort weapon and they're saying they have to send them because they've run out of other weapons so what is actually happening why are we being lied to clearly we're we're being lied to but now you have this split and and by the way the the driving force behind wars in this country have been a group of people called the neocons that are embedded in the state department from the top to the bottom that's absolutely pervasive in the state department and uh, but um, and they were, you know, a lot of them were driven out because they, after the Iraq war, they, you know, they published their manifesto in the late 1990s. It was called the Project for a New American Century. And this outlined their plans for the world. And what they said is that America had won the Cold War. And as the victor, it was, um, it was be our privilege to run the world for, an, for at least a century. It would be the American Century, Project for a New American Century. And that we should accomplish this feat through the use of our superior military power and through violence. And it outlined eight countries that needed to be overthrown, including Iraq. And then shortly after that uh, publication of that, the neocons in the White House who surrounded President George W. Bush, um, you know, defrauded us into the Iraq war by saying there were weapons of mass destruction and suggesting, you know, falsely that, that Saddam had something to do with the 9-11 attack. Now that war cost us in the end about $8 trillion. We left Iraq worse than we found it. We killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. Uh, the country is now an incoherent you know, battle between Shia and Sunni death squads. We pushed Iraq into a proxy posture with Iran, which is you know, the, exactly the foreign policy outcome that we were trying to avoid for 40 years. We created ISIS. We drove two million refugees into Europe, which destabilized all the nations in Europe for you know the next 
uh, uh, probably a century. I mean, what's happening in France with the Iraq with the riots today is a direct result of our intervention in Iraq and Syria. Brexit it was an outcome, but it was a blowback from our intervention in Iraq and Syria. So we broke apart Europe, you know, and they, and all of those neocons were driven out of office, and we thought they were gone from government forever. Um, they were pariahs, you know, they were in, in shame, disgrace, and, um, but they reappeared first in the Obama administration, a few of them, and then now they run the, uh, the, the Biden administration. Victoria Nuland, Tony Blinken, these are, you know, key figures in, uh, in, the, in fact, Victoria Newland's husband, Robert Kagan, was the author of Project for a New American Century, that PNAC document that I referred to. And they're the ones who have, or, you know, orchestrated this Ukraine war. Their vision was um, that we should, they, they've always wanted to dismantle and balkanize Russia and run Russia and, um, and be able to devour its natural resources, you know, have U.S. companies in exploiting the oil, et cetera. So they believed that Russia was weak militarily and, um, and that Putin was weak. They were mistaken. And they said they felt like if we punished Russia with these draconian sanctions, the economy would implode, it would destabilize the country, they would overthrow Putin, and whoever replaced Putin, no matter if they were more nationalist, more violent, it wouldn't matter because Putin himself was the guy that was holding Russia together. And they had to get rid of him because then it would, the whole Rush, uh, you know, Russian enterprise would fall apart. And they, you know, they say in, in Brzezinski's book, et cetera, they say again and again and again, we got to draw Russia into a war like we did in Afghanistan and expose its military. And it's best to draw them to a war against NATO. And then we can deploy all of NATO forces against them. We can expose the weakness of the Russian army and the Russian state. It will, uh, they'll, there'll be an ousting of Putin, et cetera. This was their plan. So, you know, Putin did not want to go into Ukraine. We now know that's clear. He wanted to sign the Minsk Accords. Even when Donbass and Lugansk voted to leave Ukraine, he said no. 90, they voted 90 to 10 to leave. He said no. You stay part of Ukraine, but let's make a deal to keep, um, to protect you from, you know, from the violence by the government that, you know, the U.S. installed in Ukraine in 2014. And, um, and let's uh, keep NATO out of the Ukraine, which was the existential threat that they were most frightened about. It, the U.S. kept saying, we're going to put, uh, we're going to put NATO into the Ukraine. We're going to violate all of our promises not to do that. And and uh, then we torpedoed the Minsk Accords. Mm -hmm. France agreed to it. Germany agreed to it. Russia had agreed to it. And Zelensky ran in 2019, saying that uh, anyone 70 percent of the vote, a comedian, wins with no political experience. It's like Dave, if you ran for president, promising peace, and because God help us all, <laughs> that you got elected, and then you change your mind, right? That's what happened. Something changed his mind. Clearly, he was threatened with murder uh, by um, nationalists, ultra-nationalists within the Ukrainian government, and threatened with a cutoff by Victoria Nuland and the people, you know, the neocons in the White House and the State Department. So then, what we now know is that in April of 2022, they signed a peace agreement modeled on the Minsk Accords. Putin signed it, and Zelensky signed it. And the Russians were acting in good faith by withdrawing all their, their forces from the Ukraine. What happens? We send, the White House sends Boris Johnson over there to torpedo that agreement. So we wanted this war, and we wanted it for something that had nothing to do with the Ukraine. Well, now the neocons are getting cold feet, and there is division within the neocons. And Richard Haas, who's one of the oldest neocons, is now saying, you know, Biden administration sending cluster bombs. They're going to try to let Ukraine into NATO. What's going to happen then? Right then, we're, then we're bound. Then all what what will really happen, Dave, is this: the, we we then have to then NATO's NATO is going to throw Russia out of the Ukraine, including Crimea. 
Russia will never leave. That it would be like us being defeated with by Mexico. It's not going to happen. You saw, I mean, you remember what happened to, to Stalingrad, the, the, the sacrifice the Russians were willing to make during World War II. The Russians are unbeatable. They, they're killing Ukrainians right now at a 7 to 1 ratio. We've killed 350,000 Ukrainians completely unnecessarily. They're butchering. We've turned that country into an abattoir of death for the flower of Ukrainian youth. And, but now, if we let them into NATO, the defeat that they've, that they've now suffered, now all of NATO is going to go in there. But here's what really is going to happen. Many of the NATO countries are going to refuse. Greece will never go to war against Russia. Many, right. it'll, it'll be us, in essence. What? And what it will do is it will expose Title V, which is the agreement that where they all have, and if one of them goes to war, they all have to go to war. Mm -hmm. It will expose that as a paper tiger, and all of NATO then will fall apart. So the neocons in the White House are now divided because some of them, the smarter ones, are terrified that this will be the end of NATO. And, um, and so they're now saying, you know, they're now telling uh, President Biden, you can't. Let, um, let Ukraine into NATO and, um, and you know, who knows what he's going to do because who knows how much of these decision making is actually taking place in Joe Biden's brain and how much of it is just being told to him, you know, do this, do that. And it's unclear. Because I would say I would say it's probably very very little in Joe Biden's brain. So let me just let's just follow up on that, and then I just have one more for you, and then we're we're good. Uh, so what would you do? I mean, how? how so now it's January twenty five. What what are you doing on day one to make sure that this thing doesn't escalate? I'm going to negotiate a peace with Putin. Uh, you know, it's our war. It's a proxy war between the U.S. and Russia, and I'll negotiate a peace. And of course, the Ukrainians will be part of that. And, you know, but let's negotiate a peace. If Putin's wanted to negotiate from the beginning, we haven't talked to the Russians for at least six months. Why aren't we talking to them every day? And by the way, you know, the ne these neocons like Richard Haas are secretly talking to the Russian leadership because they want to get out of there now. They understand that they made a huge, huge mistake. Right, you know, Putin, by our own, we, you know, we do polling over there. The U.S. firms do polling, and our government does polling. And those polls are showing an extraordinary popularity. Putin is now stronger than ever. You know, he's got 90% popularity and approval ratings among the Russian people. So, you know, they have not weakened him. They've strengthened him. And the, and the, you know, the Russian people are resolved and they are not going to win, lose this war. I want to ask you just one other thing, because, uh, you know, we've, people have heard you talk about some of the reasons you like Trump and some of the reasons you dislike Trump. And obviously you've laid out here some of your frustrations with, with Biden and the Democrat party. But the one other guy that seems to be in the mix here, I don't know that I've heard you talk about it all actually, is DeSantis. He's a huge reason why I moved my family and two companies here to Florida. And I see what the results of, of governing right are. Uh, I see you guys sort of lined up on COVID. I see you kind of lined up on the agencies, certainly on, on the border. I saw the video you did at our, uh, you know, the wall in Mexico, just watching hundreds of people from, as you said, dozens of countries just walk right through. I'm wondering, do you see any touch points there or, or and, and what maybe are the, the chasms there that I'm not seeing? Well, I thought what he did during COVID was really, you know, real leadership. He um, he broke with the the dominant theology, and he did what he, exactly what a leader should do is he got, he got contacted the best scientists in the world, you know the scientists from uh, from Stanford, from Harvard, from Oxford. He flew them into Florida and had them sit down and say, "What actually should we be doing?" And, you know, he asked the right questions. And I think, you know, Florida uh, ended up with a much better record than any of the other states, even though Florida has this population, you know, the most vulnerable population because it has, a, you know, a lot of seniors, a disproportionate mm -hmm. number of seniors in Florida. And yet they still did a lot better than, you know, particularly comparable states, high states like California. 
with many fewer seniors. And so I thought he did really well in that. Um, I, uh, you know, I don't know. I feel like some of the, um, the stuff that he's done since then have, have kind of a mean side to it. Um, and uh, which I don't, I don't like that. It, it feels a little. It feels like bullying. But I don't know. I mean, I, you know, my my. I I've talked. I've met with him twice, and both of our meetings were very very um, friendly. And I um, and I really really like his wife Casey. I think she's fantastic. Um, and so you know, uh, I guess. Um, uh, things to think about and more to be seen. Robert, I will leave you with this because I say it on the show whenever we play your clips that uh, if the Democrats will not put you on that debate stage, I don't know if it's too late, but I have a feeling that the Republicans would. <laughs> so either way, I, I wish you a lot of luck and I thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for, so much for having me. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of mindless drivel, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.